Question 12 from Section 2 of the 2019 National 5 Physics Examination from the SQA. A technician carries out an experiment using the apparatus shown to determine the half-life of a radioactive source. And for three marks, we're asked to describe how the apparatus can be used to determine the half-life of the radioactive source. So we'll flip over now to the radioactive uh, simulation site uh, from Marlin Physics and we'll see how this can be carried out in a virtual way. You can see, first of all, we have the radioactive source lined up with the Geiger Muller detector tube. Now, when radioactive particles are given off from the radioactive source, they enter into the Geiger Muller tube and they create ions, and these ions then create other ions, and what effect you have is you have an avalanche of these, and that makes up a small electric current, which is then displayed through a speaker and you actually can hear the cracks of each event. And that's counted. And the counter system out here, which the Geiger Miller detector is connected to, is set to count every five seconds. So over the course of five seconds, it will count the number of uh, radioactive uh, events taking place in the Geiger Miller tube. And it will stop every five seconds and display the number on the screen in counts per five seconds. So it doesn't matter if it's counts per second or counts per minute. We're, we're taking more counts every five seconds. The clock in the top right hand side is going to be a measure of the time of the duration of the experiment. So every five seconds you're going to have a reading on that. But note you will start the experiment and the clock will go to five seconds before it takes the first reading. So five seconds of the clock really stands for the initial time. So we'll call that zero. So when you get to something like 10 seconds, it'll be five seconds. 15 seconds will be 10 seconds when you record everything in your table. And the most important fact also to know is that you have previously measured the counts per five seconds due to the background radiation. So you take away the radioactive source and you set up the machine as shown and over five seconds you take repeated readings and you'll get that the counts on the machine is registering two. So that means you're going to get two counts per five seconds coming from the background radiation. And background radiation is radiation coming from the rocks, coming from the air, coming from the building itself, coming from, uh, from space. So you have to subtract that background radiation from your readings to get the true activity of the radioactivity of the source. So we'll start the experiment then. So we start the machine and it's beginning to count and process. And after five seconds, bingo, there's your first reading. And that's 521, which will record it as zero seconds. There, five seconds later, is your next reading. And then you get successive readings like that. The most important thing to note is that the count per five seconds is actually decreasing. That's because the radioactive atoms in the radioactive source are becoming stable, are given off the radiation and becoming stable, which means there's less radioactive atoms emitting radiation. So we're coming up to the 40 second mark in experiment, which is really our 35 seconds in the table. And you can see we've got a count of seven counts per five seconds. And then we get a final count of 13. Don't worry about that because we're counting radioactive decay and it can be a bit random at the end. So now we have got all our data, we have to go back and assemble that data. So first of all, here's a quick summary of what we did. We measure the count in say five second intervals. In the exam, that would be done by your little stop clock here. Then we record every five seconds the count per five seconds. So on our, our clock up here, you'd maybe count five seconds in a second hand and then record your reading on the counter. Once that's down, you would subtract the background count rate from each of your readings and then you would just simply plot a graph. So what do we actually get from our table? So here's our table here. This is the time when we took our first reading and we set that to zero seconds. And we can see we've got 519 counts per five seconds. Now we've already taken away the two counts per second. We've taken away the background radiation. And that's our data here. So you can see along the x-axis we've got time. And along up the y-axis we've got the counts per five seconds. It doesn't matter if it's counts per second or counts per ten seconds. We're, we're looking at how the counts per five seconds changes over a certain period of time.
So how do we find the half-life of that? Well, what we do very simply is we go to our graph and you can see we might start off uh, a point here. So we'll mark this on the graph here like this with this red pen. There's our initial point there. And what we do is we go down halfway from that. So I don't know what that value is. It's been uh, 520 or something like that. So 520, half of that is going to give you what? Uh, 260. So we come down to 260 here and we'd make a mark on the graph there. And we would just read over and see how long it took for that to happen. So we take a, a line and we go across to the graph and then finally we go down from the graph like that. And from there, we could measure the half-life of that particular radioactive substance. And you can see that roughly it's going to be five seconds. So we say the radioactive half-life of that substance would be five seconds. So the substance we looked at, the radioactive half-life, would be equal to five seconds. Now what does that tell us? It tells us that every five seconds, the radioactive counts per second on the counter will go down by a half. And you can see that from our table here, from 519 down to 263 is roughly about a half, roughly about a half again, roughly about a half, and it's taking place every five seconds. So that's how you would find the half-life of a radioactive source. Question 12 continued part B. The technician carries out the experiment over a period of 30 minutes and displays the data obtained in the graph as shown. Now, for one mark, it says suggest an important an improvement that the technician could make to the procedure to more easily determine the value of the half-life of this source. Well, as you can see, we begin with a reading up here of a value of about, say, 250. Now, half of 250 is going to give you 125, which will be down here. But as you can see, we cannot read that off the graph. We cannot go and read that off the graph because we haven't got enough data. Whereas compared to my data we took down from our graph, and that's it there, you can see we've got quite a lot of data over the certain time, and we can see we can easily find the half-life, the half-value uh, from the graph. We start up here, the half of that would be here, we can go across, we reach the graph, we can go down. But in the technician's case, we come down to a half value, but it doesn't meet the graph. So the simple re answer for this one would be that the technician has got to take lots and lots more readings in order to get the shape of that curve in such a way that he's able to, in fact, uh, calculate the half-life. So he's got to take more and more readings. So one mark suggestion is quite easy. It is quite simple. The technician has got to take more and more readings for a longer time. Uh, than the time you stopped experimenting at, maybe longer than 30 minutes, maybe even an hour, to in order to get enough data to ascertain the half-life from the graph. Part C. In a second experiment, the technician absorbs 1.2 microjoules of energy throughout their body from a radioactive source. The mass of the technician is 80.0 kilograms, and for three marks, we're asked to calculate the absorbed dose received by the technician. So we go to our formula sheet at the end of the exam. We can see that the absorbed dose D equals the energy divided by the mass, energy absorbed divided by the mass. So it's going to be that second formula there in the formula sheet. So we ring that. That's the formula we're going to be using. So we'll just put that down in your notes then. The absorbed dose D equals the energy and divided by the mass which absorbs that energy. The energy in this case is 1.2 microjoules, so we can write that as 1.2 times 10 to minus 6 of a joule. And we're going to divide that by the mass, which is 80.0 kilograms. And when we do that in a calculator, we're going to end up with a value of 1.5. And it's going to be times 10 to minus 8. Now, what's units of absorbed dose? Well, we know we've got the unit of joule per kilogram, but that's going to be equal to 1 gray. So, absorbed dose is always given the units of a gray, G-Y. So, the absorbed dose is 1.5 times 10 to minus 8 grays. Question 12, part C continued. During the experiment, the technician receives an equivalent dose of 4.5 times 10 to minus 8 sieverts. 
Calculate the radiation weighting factor of this source. Now we go to our formula sheet, you can see it's going to be the third equation down. H equals dWr, and that's it ringed. So that's going to be the equation we're going to be using then. So H, which is the dose equivalent, is going to equal to the absorbed dose times the radiation weighting factor WR. WR is the radiation weighting factor that's applied to different radiations because different radiations can be more dangerous than one another. So if one particular radiation's got a higher WR, uh, that means quite simply the weighting factor is higher, therefore the radiation is much more dangerous. The H, which is the equivalent dose, gives you an indication of how harmful your dose is. So in this case, we asked to find WR. So we've just got to rearrange, so therefore WR has got to be equal to the H, the dose equivalent, divided by the absorbed dose D. Now we've already found out what the absorbed dose D is. The absorbed dose we found out was 1.5 from the previous question, times 10 to the minus 8 grays. So 8GW, and the dose equivalent is 4.5 times 10 to minus 8, and that's going to be measured in sievers. So we do that in a calculation. You can see then that the radiation uh, weighting factor, WR, is going to be equal to 3. And there's going to be no units involved now, it's just a number. So the radiation weighting factor is 3. Question 12, part D. The technician wears a film badge to monitor exposure to radiation. The film badge contains a piece of photographic film behind windows of different materials. And we can see the different materials there, which is round about the film badge. The film badge has got the film inside and it's really protected against light. No light can get into it. But these little windows here will allow in different types of radiation depending on the material which is in front of the window. Here's a real picture of one here like that. These have been superseded by modern electronic badges now which can monitor radiation and can be plugged into a computer. But these ones have been used for years and years and years and still are used today. What happens is after a day's work, the worker who's working with radioactive sources will hand the badge in. The badge will be broken open as you can see in the picture and the photographic film will be developed. And the areas where the photographic film has gone from kind of grey to black indicates a lot of exposure to that particular type of radiation. You can tell if it's been exposed to radiation. So really the whole story of these film badges is the following. Uh, radiation falling on photographic film changes the film's emulsion from grey to black. Radiation will change the emulsion of the film, the emulsion being the chemical of the film. The amount of darkening indicates the amount of radiation absorbed. You can see this window here has absorbed a lot of radiation. That corresponds to the one millimetre thick lead window. The different materials in front of the film, they ensure only certain types of radiation exposes the film. So for example, for that window there, you can see that it's very highly uh, blackened. The film has been very much exposed to radiation. But the radiation type is revealed because it's passed through one millimetre thick of lead window. And definitely beta radiation will not pass through it. Uh, alpha, definitely not, because these badges are not really used to detect alpha radiation. I think you can guess why. So for one millimetre thick lead window, that would really... Uh, block out the beta radiation but allow the gamma radiation to go in then so you could detect if that one was all blackened it was definitely gamma radiation behind that one and for different thicknesses of the the windows they will let through different sort of kind of energy levels of the beta rays so finally that last statement there gamma radiation would pass through the one millimeter thick lead while other radiation like beta wouldn't. So you'll be able to tell that this window here, blackened as it was, the worker was exposed to quite a lot of gamma radiation, because gamma can pass through one millimetre thick lead window where the other radiations cannot. So the film badge works on the simple principle that radiation uh, will fog or blacken photographic film when it's developed. And by placing different uh, windows in front of this, uh, badge, you will allow block out certain types of radiation, so therefore you can determine which radiations, uh, which type of radiation has gotten through a particular window, and that can be used to calculate the overall exposure and dosage given to the radioactive worker.